Okay, good morning. So let's uh, recap what we were talking about last time. Sorry, my microphone wasn't working, wasn't on properly. Good morning again. Let's recap um, what we were talking about last time regarding uh, protein uh, tertiary structure. So we've already discussed the secondary structural elements, which uh, can be either um, alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. Those are the types of structural uh, shapes that the contiguous areas of protein as it starts being constructed start assembling with each other. But once the protein grows beyond a certain point, these regions that are forming locally will then start folding on themselves and interacting with more distant regions of the whole bigger structure of the protein. And those types of interactions are actually held together by uh, one of the, uh, among all of the, let me say all of the possibilities of the types of uh, interactions that can happen between two particles or structures that are interacting. So we can have hydrogen bonding interactions. Ooh, let me change this color because I don't like that. Um, we can have hydrogen bonding interactions between functional groups that are able to participate in hydrogen bonds. Whenever you have a carboxylic acid side chain, which exists as the form as a carboxylate and an amine side chain, which will exist in the form of an ammonium, one has a minus, the other one has a plus charge, that causes what we call a salt bridge, okay? Also, of course, as an ionic interaction between those structures. We can have, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit, you can have um, actually uh, hydrophobic interactions form mediated by London dispersion forces. When you have side chains of amino acids that are sticking up, protruding from the surface of the structure, and they can then interact with each other through three-dimensional space, if you have several pieces of non-polarity, non-polar side chains, they will interact by what we call hydrophobic interactions. And then the last one is a uh, covalent bond here shown in the form of disulfide bonds. In the previous slide, we had discussed that also metal ions, metal ions can become incorporated into the structures of proteins and those metal ions serve as anchor points where different portions of the structure can attach themselves to, and that then helps to uh, provide the structure with, a, with, with, its in, with, with its structural integrity that holds it all together and holds it all in place. So when we're speaking of what we call globular proteins, which are the types of proteins that are water soluble and floating around in your bodily fluids, because those proteins are surrounded by water, their exterior portions will be primarily comprised of polar or charged amino acids, which will have the ability to interact with, with water. Conversely, as those, protein, as those proteins fold on themselves and those structural elements start coming together to give the protein its final shape, anything that is not water soluble, anything that is highly uh, nonpolar will primarily exist towards the interior of that protein. Again, similar to what we discussed previously uh, in terms of micelles and talking about soaps, the micelle will have a nonpolar interior. That's where all the oily substances ultimately end up when you wash your hands because they want to be away from the water. The outside of the micelle is, contains those polar or ionic heads that will interact with the water. So similarly in proteins, when proteins fold and they're existing and have functions in an aqueous medium, because water is so polar, they will fold and arrange themselves in such a way that the hydrophobic amino acids are towards the interior, the hydrophilic amino acids, the ones that want to interact with water, that have a charge, that have polarity, those are going to be towards the outside of the, of the structure. Now, conversely to that, whenever you have a protein that is embedded within a cell membrane, cell membranes are highly nonpolar fatty entities. So in that regard, many proteins serve functions 
not in the aqueous medium of your bodily fluids, but they serve important functions as integral components of cell membranes. Whenever those proteins are embedded within a cell membrane, what happens is that there's a reversal of this arrangement because at that point, since the protein will be um, surrounded by the nonpolar components that make up the membrane, then it actually is more beneficial or the best interaction of that protein with the membrane to have its nonpolar components on the surface, the outside, where it can more easily and better interact with the membrane. And then in that case, because the membrane is a highly hydrophobic environment, everything that's uh, polar, everything that's charged, will actually be folded towards the inside of the structure. And in that regard, they'll find themselves, they'll find each other towards the inside, but they'll be away from that nonpolar greasy membrane that they really don't want to interact with. So as I mentioned, tertiary structure is maintained by a combination of any of the various types of uh, interactions that can exist between atoms and even larger structures. So again, London dispersion forces is what involves between hydrophobic amino acids, things that are completely nonpolar, they will be interacting with uh, each other through these types of interactions. If I go back one slide, when you have hydrophobic side chains that are all made of hydrocarbons, these are interacting with each other through these types of uh, London dispersion type forces. When you have polar structures, they will interact by a combination of dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonds are technically a type of dipole-dipole interactions, but they're particularly uh, strong because of that uh, OH, let's call it XH, X can be nitrogen or oxygen. When that interacts with another X that has lone pairs, there's going to be an interaction between those two. Remember, these protons are partially positive. These atoms are partially negative. And there is a very, very strong attraction between NH bonds or OH bonds and other nitrogens and oxygens that may exist in biological structures, of which there's many. As I mentioned, when you have um, uh, ionized acid and basic side chains like carboxylates and ammonium ions, because they have a charge, they form what we call ionic interactions, also known as salt bridges. Going back to the previous slide, I mentioned here, for example, there's an interaction between an ammonium, which is partial, uh, which is not partial, fully charged in a positive sense, and then a carboxylate, which is negatively charged. These will interact with each other by virtue of their opposite charges. We call that a salt bridge or an ionic interaction. And then, of course, the last one is actually a bona fide covalent interaction. These first three are non-covalent, okay, non-covalent. A covalent bond would involve a bona fide formation of a covalent bond, as the, as the term implies. So the most common situation is the formation of what we call disulfide bonds. So thiols can become oxidized to form disulfides. These are amongst the most common types of structural uh, features of proteins that help hold them together. So here's an example of two disulfide bonds holding different pieces of the structure together. And then as I mentioned, there's also the involvement of metal ions that they can become incorporated into the structure of a protein. And by way of lone pairs, what happens is that you have an atom let's call it X again, that has a lone pair, and you have, let's now call it Y, it doesn't have to be the same atom. You have some kind of a metal ion coming from somewhere. These two atoms will, by virtue of that bridge, which is the metal cation, they will latch onto that metal, and then these can be coming from all sorts of different portions of the protein. They don't have to be anywhere close to each other, but the moment they find the metal in between them, that sandwich between them, that gives anything that's in the middle a unique shape and what holds it in place is this interaction between the two atoms and that very uh, particular metal ion. So those of you who are in the nutrition program, for example, um, we have to intake into the diet. I've mentioned, I've mentioned this multiple times. We have to intake it into the diet, a whole variety of different uh, vitamins and minerals, right? And there's a whole course, in fact, devoted to vitamins and minerals. And these minerals are, in, in large part, these metal ions 
of which there's a whole list uh, of, of metal ions that we need to take into the diet, they end, they end up finding their way um, through the body and finding a home in these proteins that if we didn't have those ions, these proteins wouldn't be assemble themselves and we wouldn't be able to have this conversation, okay? All right, so he, this was meant to be a little clicker question. Um, so if you look at these two uh, amino acid side chains, uh, what type of what type of interaction would you uh, predict that they're going to engage in? So what you need to do is then analyze what types of side chains are involved here. This is a polar neutral, and this one it's not a carboxylic acid; it's an amide. Amides do not easily ionize, so this is also polar neutral. So if it's polar hydrophobic interactions are out, salt bridges are out because they're not ionic. They won't form a covalent bond. The only instances where covalent bonds will form, again, is if you have one thiol finding another thiol and they will ultimately form a disulfide bond. And again, the metal situation, which is not involved in this question. So not covalent, the logical answer is hydrogen bonds. And if you, fa in fact, if you sort of analyze the, um, the structure of that particular functional group, what ends up happening is that the, uh, the amide can sort of arrange itself in a very particular way like this, and then you can have the um, CH2OH such that the oxygen can, in, through its lone pairs, can interact with this hydrogen bond and form a hydrogen bond there, and then there's two lone pairs here, and this can interact in a second hydrogen bond there. So it's hydrogen bonding is going to be the interaction. Anytime we have polar neutral side chains, it's a hydrogen bonding interaction what's going to predominate in, in, in those types of interactions between amino acid side chains. All right, so I mentioned previously how sugars can become integral components of proteins um, they can actually, when we mentioned the, the ABO uh, blood groups, when we talked about the carbohydrates section, remember that if, if you recall, those sugars, those oligosaccharides were bonded to the red blood cell. Well, it turns out what they're actually bonded to on the red blood cell is a protein on the red blood cell surface. So proteins are critically important components of cell membranes. They serve all kinds of functions from being regulatory structures that sort of allow the entry and exit of nutrients and waste products. They control the entry or exit of metabolites, hormones, all kinds of different things. They serve as receptors to uh, bind things that are on the outside then send a signal towards the inside and then things start happening at that point, what we call signal transduction. Those of you who may be taking immunology in the fall are going to be learning with me a lot about signal transduction in the immune system. So it turns out many proteins, for them to be fully functional, not only do they need to have acquired the proper three-dimensional shape that they must fold into by virtue of secondary, tertiary, et cetera, structures, but sometimes they need to acquire a pattern of sugars on their surface. And when this happens, a fully formed protein that then in order for it to have its function uh, possible, it needs to have uh, sugars attached to it. We call those proteins glycoproteins because again, they have sugars on their surface and without those sugars, the protein is simply unable to carry out its ultimate job. So here are examples of some glycoproteins. They can be globular, meaning they can be floating around. Notice this one doesn't have a little tail here to hang it on, latch it on to the, to the, uh, to the membrane. That one is just kind of floating around, but it has sugars attached to uh, particular amino acids. So when the, when the side chain of the amino acid involved provides a nitrogen, for the binding of the sugars, we call that an N-glycan or N-glycoside. If it's an oxygen, oxygens would be, for example, back to this, 
this has an oxygen in the side chain. So if a sugar latches onto this by way of a glycosidic, i.e. acetal bond, we call that an O-glycoside. If it's some nitrogen functionality, typically not one that's an amide, the one that's most common is lysine that has an ammonium ion uh, bonded to it. This nitrogen can actually bind a sugar in a similar fashion to the glycoside. In that case, what happens is that the carbon is simultaneously bonded to an oxygen and simultaneously bonded to a nitrogen. So this is what we call an N-glycosidic bond. So when there's a nitrogen available, some of these sugars can latch on to that nitrogen. Those are called N-glycans. Here's another one, N-glycan. If it's an oxygen, ST means serine, uh, serine or threonine is the two amino acids that have oxygens on their side chains that are capable of making these types of bonds. There's also tyrosine, so there's actually three. Um, this would be called an O-glycan because it's bonded to the oxygen. So when we spoke of the ABO blood group types, it's something like this. The red blood cells have a protein on their surface, and on that protein is where that pattern of glycosides will exist that will then impart that structure with being either A, B, or O, or if it has both A and B, then we call it an A, B, and if it has neither of those, we call it type O, if you recall. So glycoproteins are an important subclass of proteins um, because they are, there are many, many examples of proteins that for their ultimate functionality, they must have sugars bonded to them. So this is what I was mentioning uh, moments ago that we had already seen this slide before, uh, again, a glycoprotein is any protein that is bonded to uh, any type of a carbohydrate. So these types of proteins serve multitude, a multitude of different functions. They can be receptors for toxins, for example, many toxins, uh, toxic agents produced by microorganisms or environmental exposures or whatever. They enter the body and they can actually uh, have some kind of an affinity for particular carbohydrate structures that are part of these glycoproteins that are in the membrane. Many viruses, many viruses. Now we don't know enough about um, COVID-19. This is actually something that I'm doing a little bit of uh, information research on for my fall immunology course. I wanna be well versed on what are the features of COVID in terms of how it infects and what it does and et cetera. Uh, so those of you who are going to be in immunology, stay tuned for more information on that. But many viruses are, in fact, they are looking for, when they're infecting a cell, what they're looking for is a specific pattern of sugars that are latched onto a specific protein. In many cases, it's actually a combination of the sugar pattern and the protein structure, and the, the virus looks for the combination of the two, and that's what then allows them to infect cells. For example, HIV, uh, its receptor is actually a receptor on immune cells that's called CD4. CD4 is indeed a glycoprotein, and that virus it will look for cells that have that CD4 protein, and not only is it the protein piece, but it's also the, glyco, uh, the, the glycoside uh, piece that's on, on the top of that, of that uh, surface of that immune cell. So many larger microorganisms like bacteria, they also interact with other cells, whether they're other bacteria or larger microorganisms or even with human cells. Um, the ones that are infectious are particularly looking for specific structures, combination of protein and carbohydrate so that they can latch onto that and then ultimately cause disease. Uh, in other cases, it's just a, a symbiotic, a good interaction between cells 
All right, I think I'm back. So, um, continuing on with this slide, the last point I wanted to make was that even within your own body, different types of cells will interact with other types of cells. So cell-cell communication, cell-cell communication, in many cases involves these uh, receptors on one cell interacting with a glycoprotein on the other cell. And it's either the, the sugar component or a combination of the sugar with the protein component, just as I was mentioning for uh, microorganisms, that allows for that interaction to happen because it serves as a recognition feature. So the protein with these sugars is like a little antenna that other cells can recognize and that then allows them to properly communicate with each other. All right, so let's introduce a little bit of new terminology. Whenever a fully functional protein is composed entirely of amino acids and nothing else than the protein itself, and it's still fully functional, we call that a simple protein. However, some proteins require, as I've mentioned with the sugars, but it doesn't have to be sugar, as we're going to see. Some proteins, for their ultimate function, require the incorporation of a non-protein, what we call a prosthetic group. And that is what then ultimately gives them their function. Without that, they cannot do their function, right? So technically, the sugars that we've been talking about sort of fall into that category. Turns out when we speak of these prosthetic groups, it's actually other entities that are actually embedded within the protein for the most part and without them the, the full function cannot be carried out but technically you can include those sugars in that discussion anyway the whole point is when a protein requires something else something else beyond protein to carry out its function we call that entity a prosthetic group and the protein at that point is referred to as a conjugated protein Okay, conjugated proteins by definition require a prosthetic group or some other structural component that is non-protein in order for them to carry out their job. For example, a classic example, hemoglobin and myoglobin. They require heme. Heme is what binds to the oxygen on that iron that's in the middle. If you don't have the heme, does it matter how much hemoglobin you have? or globin, because it, it turns out it becomes hemoglobin when it acquires the heme. If you have globin by the buckets, but you have no heme, guess what? You're not making hemoglobin, you're not carrying oxygen, because this piece is what is actually ultimately needed. Without it, the protein cannot carry out that job. So there are many examples of proteins that, yes, the protein is obviously critical, but if you don't have that little piece, that other final component, i.e. prosthetic group, that is what makes the protein a conjugated protein, without that prosthetic group, the protein cannot do what it's meant to do. So there are many, many examples of these things, and we'll see them as, we, as, we, as they become relevant throughout the discussion. So there's actually one more level of protein structure, which we call quaternary structure. Okay, so quaternary structure actually refers to when you have what we call a multimeric protein. So multiple fully formed protein structures, each with their own individual and fully established tertiary structure. They come together and they assemble, typically non-covalently, again, through these dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ionic, London dispersion, that whole combination of things. In some cases, uh, disulfide bonds can also come into play, but typically these proteins require some level of flexibility, it turns out, for these pieces to be able to be mobile. And if they're covalently linked, that limits that mobility. But that doesn't mean that there are not examples. <coughs> of proteins were quaternary structure that they are actually held together covalently. I'm just taking a sip of water here for one moment. All right, so when you have these types of proteins that have multiple 
subunits is what we call them. Each individual piece that in and of itself is fully formed. When they aggregate and assemble, each piece is referred to as a subunit. And then we call each, uh, we call the, the aggregate, the, the, uh, the multimer, if you will, right? It has multiple subunits. So as we've said, the same types of intermolecular interactions uh, involved in tertiary structure. And there are many examples of these multimeric proteins where when something interacts with one of the subunits that causes a change in the interactions between all of the subunits, and that change is transmitted throughout the structure, and that actually changes subtly, but sometimes significantly, how that structure interacts with yet another entity. So we're, we're gonna see this in a moment, it's gonna make more sense. So whenever these multimeric proteins engage in this type of behavior, we call that cooperativity or allosterism. And what this means, again, is if you have a multiple subunit protein, if one of the subunits interacts with some external agent that it's interacting with, that causes a small change in the structure of that subunit that is then transmitted to the others. And that small change can then affect how the remaining subunits interact with other entities in their surroundings. So the classic example, as we're going to see, is hemoglobin. But just asking you a question, which of the following levels of protein structure does not does uh, hydrogen bonding not play any type of role in? Okay, so quaternary structure, as we've said, has the same type of interactions that hold together tertiary structure. These sort of go in this in the same flow. So all possibilities are are possible here. So dipole dipole which includes hydrogen bonds. You can have covalent, which is the disulfides and the metal ions. You can have ionic, and then you can have the uh, London dispersion, okay? Secondary structure is exclusively held together by uh, hydrogen bonds and nothing else, okay? Hydrogen bonds. Primary structure, what's happening in primary structure? The, what, what establishes primary structure is the peptide bonds, peptide bonds that hold together the amino of one end, the carboxylic acid of the other end amino acid, and then they come together and they form a peptide bond. These are covalent, covalent bonds, okay? Not of the kind that are involved in quaternary tertiary structure, but they are covalent bonds. When you form a, a, when an amino group of one amino acid bonds to the carboxylic acid of the other and they form the amide, i.e. the peptide bond, that is a covalent bond. So hydrogen bonds are in no way, shape or form involved in maintenance and establishment of primary structure, okay? Just wanna make sure you have that very, very clear. All right, so let's look at some examples. We've already seen insulin. We looked at insulin in the context when we were describing primary structure. Uh, it turns out that insulin um, is created by your um, pancreas in an inactive form that is known as pro-insulin. And this is very, very common with all sorts of different kinds of proteins, whether they're hormones or enzymes or other types of protein effector. Uh, molecules. And it's, sometimes it's an advantage because the cell will pre-produce a reasonably large quantity or medium level quantity of the substance, but you cannot have it in an active form because if it's active and you have a, a storage form of it, then that can cause all sorts of problems, right? So the, the, the cell creates the protein in an inactive form, and then when the moment comes, when the signal is received, let's say you take in a large carbohydrate meal, right? And suddenly we need to release insulin 
So that trigger, that glucose that's coming in from the intestines into the blood and suddenly starts passing through the pancreas, that triggers the production of insulin. So what happens is that this piece here that's shown here in white is actually chopped off. And what you see here in red is where it's actually cut out, right? So this is what's called C-peptide, C-peptide. And, and that produces, that causes the pro-insulin to then become fully functional insulin, okay? So insulin is actually a protein that has quaternary structure because if you notice, there's actually two components. There's this piece, and I'm gonna change colors, and then there's this piece. And if you realize the two pieces are actually joined to each other covalently in this case via disulfide bonds, okay? So insulin can be considered a protein having quaternary structure. So just a little bit of information about C-peptide. Endogenously made insulin, the insulin that's coming from your pancreas, because the one that the pancreas makes is formed initially as pro-insulin that ultimately becomes insulin. As pro-insulin is activated, you get an equimolar amount, equal amounts of C-peptide and this bottom piece, which is the actual insulin, released into the circulation. However, insulin that is synthetic, purchased for treatment of diabetes in injectable form, that type of insulin is only the actually active insulin, okay? So when people inject themselves with insulin in injectable form, they're not getting any C-peptide. They're getting the real active uh, hormone. So why is it, why, is, why do we care about this? Because it turns out there have been cases, murder cases, in which the person has been given insulin, okay? And then all you need to do to establish that the person received a high dose of exogenous insulin is to look at how much C-peptide they have. And if they have a lot of insulin and they have very little C-peptide, well, guess what? That insulin came from an outside source and people have been convicted for killing other people. And the C-peptide is the key here. No C-peptide or little C-peptide relative to the amount of insulin is the proof that there's been exogenous insulin um, given. This is also, I mean, it's not necessarily for murder cases. This is not uncommon, in fact, for uh, elderly diabetic patients that will inject themselves with too much insulin. And then, of course, there's the suspicion where they kill this and that. You go measure, but then it's ultimately determined, yes, they don't have any C-peptide. This was an insulin overdose. And then, of course, it was ultimately determined that there was no necessarily no foul play. But there have been cases where foul play has been, have been confirmed by measuring C-peptide. This is forensic science for those of you who are interested in these kinds of things. All right, so let's now talk about a, a, a few very important physiologically relevant proteins that we need to talk about their structure and their function. We're gonna start with hemoglobin. We're gonna talk a little bit about collagen and actually keratin as well. And we're gonna end with talking about immunoglobulins, which is not, uh, the fancy word for antibodies. So we'll start with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein, four subunits. It's actually two pairs of uh, subunits. There's different kinds or uh, varieties of hemoglobin. The most common one, the one that most of us have in our body is what we call hemoglobin A. And hemoglobin A, the abbreviation for hemoglobin is HB commonly. Hemoglobin A contains two alpha globin subunits and two beta globin subunits. There's different globin proteins out there. And it turns out that you are actually, as you're developing in the fetus, you have what's called fetal hemoglobin, which is, is a different uh, pairing of, of subunits. Um, and as you are born and you develop and you start growing, then all of your hemoglobin uh, F, which is what we call F for fetal, ultimately becomes hemoglobin A, which is the most common one. So as we know, hemoglobin contains heme, which is the prosthetic group, and it's that prosthetic group that ultimately binds oxygen. So because there are four, two alphas and two betas, there are four hemes 
heme molecules. There's one within each of the globin proteins. And there are four um, heme units within the whole protein. We're going to talk about that. So the, as we know, the function of uh, hemoglobin is to serve as a transporter of oxygen in the blood. Turns out that a portion of your CO2, about 10% of your carbon dioxide that's in your body carried out by your bodily fluids and whatnot, um, is contained within red blood cells covalently bonded to globin and that produces a um, functional group that's called the carb amino functional group. So what happens is that an amino group, again, let's say a lysine, reacts with CO2 and that ultimately forms a uh, nitrogen that's bonded to these uh, carbon, oops, this is, this is a single bond over here. Nitrogen bonds to the CO2 and it latches onto it and it carries it. Okay, so about 10% of all the CO2 that's in your body is carried by hemoglobin in the form of what we call carbamino hemoglobin. So as I mentioned, there are four, four oxygen molecules that can be carried by hemoglobin because there's four hemes, each one within each of the globins. And um, I mentioned the term cooperativity or allosterism a little bit earlier. This is actually in a cooperative, i.e. allosteric manner. So what that means is that of the four hemes, let's say you have a hemoglobin that has no oxygen bonded to it. When one oxygen molecule, one, binds to one of the four hemes, that actually causes a small change in shape. We call it a conformational change in that globin that is carrying the oxygen. If you recall, we had discussed in previous lectures in a different context, how is it that the oxygen binds to the iron? And if you remember the dome, the dome-shaped heme, when the iron binds to the oxygen, it's actually pulled and it's flattened. And when that happens, because the heme, the, the heme, the iron in the heme, is actually also covalently bonded to the protein through a histidine side chain amino acid, specifically a nitrogen. All of this, if you go back on your notes, and now that you understand amino acid lingo, this should make complete sense. You need to go back and look at it. I think we're gonna see pictures of it anyway. Um, that pulls on the protein, causes it to change shape a little bit. Well, that change in shape in that one subunit that has become oxygenated sort of causes a slight change in shape in the other three subunits that what it actually does is that it facilitates oxygen binding to the other deoxygenated globin subunits. And with every oxygen that binds, the binding of the next one is facilitated. So when you bind the second one, it actually enhances the ability of the third one to bind. And when you bind the third one, it's much, much easier to bind the fourth one, okay? So this is a critically important function of hemoglobin because in the lungs, when there's lots of oxygen, you wanna maximize the ability of that hemoglobin to trap the oxygen meaning that as every oxygen binds to a hemoglobin, it makes it easier for the next one and easier for the next one and easier for the next one to bind. In the tissues, it's the exact opposite. As you lose one and the tissue is being delivered the oxygen that it needs, as you release that first oxygen, the release of the second one is facilitated once you release two, the release of the third one is facilitated. And therefore, that leaves the last one, that's gonna be the easiest one to let go because it's sort of going in the reverse direction. This is another critically important function in the tissues because in the tissues where oxygen is required for these cells to be able to be alive, the easier it is to deliver oxygen, the better, the more oxygen has been released from the hemoglobin, the easier it is to release the next one, okay? So this is what's called cooperativity.
So here it is. I, I forgot that this was your, I thought we had talked about this before. We have, but we had seen the slide. Whoops, we had seen the slide previously. So let me zoom out a little bit so that we can recap. So again, here's the heme, right? And the iron is in the middle, bonded to the four nitrogens that are in the heme. So if you notice here, they've turned it a little bit sideways. There's a histidine side chain. So this R here, this is the protein. This is the globin over here, right? A little piece of the globin is sticking out, and it's this histidine amino acid. Through this nitrogen, this is what latches on to the oxygen. That's what, that's what, that's what holds the heme in place within the confines of the globin protein. So now, flip this upside down. Here's the histidine. Here's the iron. So again, this is sort of a dome-shaped structure, right? We've now flipped it upside down. On the left, bottom left, is sort of like a cup. If you flip it upside down, it's like a dome. Well, what happens? When the oxygen comes in, in the lungs, where we have lots of oxygen, that oxygen is going to come along. Here's the O2. Whoop, it binds to that iron. And now that the oxygen is bonded to the iron, what happened? What was a dome shape is now a straight shape. So what did that do? That actually pulled down on that histidine. So this whole thing got pulled on. So what that did is that it transmitted a slight change of shape onto the globin. Now I'm drawing it blue because it's a different, it slightly changed its shape. When it binds to the oxygen, it pulls and it slightly changes its shape. So that changes the shape of one of the globins because that's where the oxygen bound. Well, that change of shape is actually transmitted to the other globin that's next to it. And that then facilitates the next one, now talk about it in blue, to that one also bind onto an oxygen. So when that one binds to oxygen, the same thing happens. That one also gets pulled on. So now you have two that have changed shape. Well, that transmits the change in shape to the other two. There's four, remember, right? All of that facilitates the oxygen binding progressively. And in the tissues, it's the exact opposite. That's what's on the bottom. In the tissues, oxygen is released, gone. Now this is back to the dome shape. This is now restored back to its original shape. And that gets progressively transmitted to the other subunits and so on and so forth. So with every gain, the next gain is easier. With every loss, the next loss is easier. So this is critically important in the lungs because the more you have, the easier it is to get it. In the tissues, the more you let go, the more you're able to deliver. And that's what the tissues need. Okay, this is important functions of cooperativity. So again, it's a critical feature of hemoglobin. This is what I've said. Everything that I've said is on this slide, right? So oxygenation, what it ultimately does is that it increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. What that means is that as it gets progressively more and more oxygenated, the affinity of that hemoglobin for oxygen increases. It can bind more and more and more oxygen and better and better and better. And this is very, very important. In the tissues, it's the exact opposite. Deoxygenation decreases the affinity of oxygen for hemoglobin. As it loses oxygen, more and more oxygen is lost, meaning it has less ability to bind oxygen. It's lower affinity with every oxygen loss. This is a critical function in the tissues where you need oxygen because the pressure of oxygen in the tissues is low. Hemoglobin is delivering that oxygen to those tissues, which are going to need it for their uh, ability to do whatever it is that they need to do with that oxygen. All right, so turns out we need to talk about some additional physiological effects that bring together oxygen and CO2 and how those two things technically work together to enhance these process of oxygen delivery and oxygen uptake. So it turns out that the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen also depends on the amount of CO2 that is present. And that is an indirect effect because it actually ultimately relies on the pH 
which is dependent on the CO2. So as you recall, when you have higher amounts of CO2, CO2 reacts with water to produce carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid then produces protons plus bicarbonate, okay? So whenever you have a lot of CO2, that ultimately translates to a slightly higher amount of protons. Now remember, we talked about the buffer system. Buffers main, they, they respond, they move this way, they move that way to ultimately maintain that pH. However, when you look locally in different places of the body, in the places in the body where there's a little bit more CO2 than in other places, the amount of protons is a slightly higher. It can still be within physiological pH. Remember, physiological, physiological pH is a range, 7.35 to 7.45. When there's more CO2, that pH may be on the higher end of range. So it may be 7, 7.4, 7.42, 7.43, a little bit higher. When there's less CO2, then the pH may be 7.37, 7.38, 7.35 on the slightly lower end. So there's still a range, a range, and it's actually 0.1 pH units, which is about 10 times, 10 fold difference in hydrogen ion concentration. That make a difference in this situation that we're talking about. So it turns out that this reaction that's shown down here is known as the Bohr effect, okay? So when you have high PCO2, higher than, higher within the range, let's, let's say it that way, you're gonna have more carbonic acid, you're gonna have more protons, that's gonna lower the pH, but the protons, the higher proton concentration, turns out that when you have protons, the protons will actually exchange with the oxygen, not directly iron. The protons will bind to certain places on the structure of globin, and that actually helps to release oxygen. So this equilibrium shifts to the right when you have a higher amount of protons, which is what happens when you have a higher pressure of CO2. Where is this useful? Well, if it's causing release of oxygen, it's obviously, it's obviously useful in the tissues. Well, what's high in the tissues? It turns out our metabolism is producing high levels of CO2, right? So in the tissues where the oxygen is actually needed, there is a higher amount of CO2 that's coming from the metabolism of those cells. So there's a slightly higher amount of hydrogen ions, i.e. lower pH, at the tissues compared to, let's say, the lungs, right? So what that does is that that slightly higher amount of protons facilitates the release of oxygen to the tissues. So then added effect, this is on top of the cooperativity that we've discussed, that as you lose more oxygen, more of them are easier to be let go. Well, guess what? On top of that, the tissues also have a slightly lower pH than other places, and that will further facilitate the release of oxygen. This is known as the Bohr effect, okay? So if the converse is true, if there is lower CO2, then you're gonna have less of that carbonic acid. The hydrogen ion concentration goes down, meaning the pH goes up. So at this point, this is being lost. So what does that do? It actually helps the hemoglobin bind oxygen. Where is this happening? Well, it turns out in the lungs where the CO2 is being blown away, the pressure of the CO2 is lower than in the tissues. So there's less CO2 in the, in the lungs that then will lower the hydrogen ion concentration and that will then also further facilitate the binding of the oxygen onto that hemoglobin. So this is the Bohr effect. This is a critically important physiological effect. So we've talked about amongst throughout the course in different contexts, some of the critically important consequences of changes in pH if it's going in the wrong direction, it can cause all kinds of physiological problems.
Here's another example of where having not the proper amount of protons in this or that location in the body can cause problems with not protein structure or function, but in this case, oxygen uptake or delivery, which is another critically important physiological function of the human body. Unfortunately, this is not this slide is 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 not going to work here on this forum because this was meant to be a, this was kind of an animated slide that it moved back and forth, ch showing you the, sh the change of shape um, as it bound and uh, debound oxygen. So this is just showing you um, a sort of a surface view. Here's one heme, here's the other heme, here's the third heme, and here's the fourth heme. And as those uh, four hemes bound oxygen, here's the alpha and beta, and well, actually it should be looked at this way. Here's the alpha two, here's the alpha pair, and let me change colors. Here's the beta globins, right? So to distinguish them, we call them alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, and each one carries a heme. And as each one binds an oxygen, it sort of changes shape. So the molecule does like a little dance back and forth and back and forth as it's gaining and losing oxygen. Unfortunately, this slide is not operational under these circumstances. All right, so there's another effect which is known as the carbaminohemoglobin effect. And this one is actually a direct effect. So the Bohr effect is indirect because it's the protons that will modulate oxygen binding, but the protons are dependent on CO2. So that's an indirect effect. This carbaminohemoglobin effect, the carbaminohemoglobin effect is a direct effect because this one also dependent on CO2 levels, but it's because of the formation of the carbaminohemoglobin that I mentioned earlier. It turns out that CO2 will covalently bind to hemoglobin. And when it does so, whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated, when it binds, it actually facilitates the release of oxygen because the carbaminohemoglobin, which is on the far right, carbaminohemoglobin, meaning hemoglobin bounded to CO2, that one actually has a lower affinity for oxygen than regular hemoglobin. So in the tissues, when you have higher levels of CO2, this is actually a good thing because that CO2 latches on to the hemoglobin that facilitates the release of oxygen. In the lungs, when the opposite is happening, we have boatloads of oxygen coming in from the air, from outside, that oxygen then latches on to the hemoglobin by brute force, pretty much, once that's bound, it actually facilitates the release of the CO2. And then what happens? The CO2 will be blown away by the actions of the lungs respiration process. Now that has been removed, this can then proceed with the cooperativity as, as normal, more oxygen, more binding, easier binding, et cetera, et cetera. So again, when you have a higher PCO2, you're gonna have more carbaminohemoglobin, you have a lower affinity for oxygen. Where is this good? In the tissues, because there's more CO2, oxygen release is facilitated, okay? In the lungs, where you have a lower PCO2, you're gonna have less of this carbaminohemoglobin. What that does, it increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. In the lungs, right, we have less CO2, that's then going to shift this whole process towards oxygen binding, which is exactly what we want to happen at the level of the lungs, okay? So there's what we call, all of these behaviors can be illustrated with what we call the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So those of you who are going on to take uh, human biochemistry or other upper division courses in biochemistry, you're gonna be learning about uh, in more detail, uh, this oxygen, um, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which allows us to study the behavior of hemoglobin. And it has what we call a sigmoidal shape. This is sort of a unique term, unique to hemoglobin. There are, there are not many other proteins that follow this specific type of behavior. Um, so hemoglobin has, the, the, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which again describes the, the behavior of hemoglobin under conditions of 
low versus high oxygen pressure is shown here in this slide. So the, the, the normal hemoglobin under no exposure to oxygen or CO2 or anything is sort of shown there in the center. Again, this is normal conditions, but in reality, the normal conditions don't really exist because there will always be oxygen in a real life situation in a physiological uh, system, right? There's always oxygen, there's always CO2, there's a certain concentration of protons. So all of that actually comes into play to actually establish how does that hemoglobin behave and what type of curve it's going to follow. So if you look at these conditions, the one that's sort of a light blue teal-ish color uh, is what we call the left shift uh, curve. It has shifted to the left. And this is the curve that results when you have uh, decreased protons, right? So you have a higher pH, decreased CO2. Turns out temperature is another effect, has, uh, another important effect. When you lower the temperature, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen will increase. Okay, which is actually, it turns out this is actually a good thing because when people go into hypothermia, uh, the oxygen is being captured by the hemoglobin in greater concentrations. And that can technically be a good thing. It's actually on the other end, when, when it comes to the release factor, then it turns out to be detrimental. So let's put it this way. In the lungs, it turns out to be a good thing. In the tissues, it turns out to be not so good. Anyway, so let's, let's not focus on temperature because that's not so much the discussion that we need to have here. So let's talk about the, the items that we've talked about, which is uh, protons and CO2. And these sort of go together with each other, right? So what happens? What did we say? When you have a, a low amount of CO2, there's the Bohr effect, which is the proton effect, which is that indirect effect. The low CO2 is going to cause the proton concentration to go down. And as we've said, that causes the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen to increase, which is what we want to happen in the lungs. When you have a low CO2, as what's happening in the lungs, when you're breathing out CO2, that also is going to increase the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So in the lungs is actually a good thing. It's a very good thing because you want to trap as much oxygen as possible. That can only be accomplished with a high affinity for oxygen. Okay. So here we have in this portion of the, of the um, curve, we can illustrate both the Bohr effect and the carbaminohemoglobin effect. And the way that you can see this is as just pick, pick a value. Let's go with tissues and veins, which is where the affinity is actually, uh, the, the PCO2 is actually a little bit lower. So at a given PO2, PO2, notice, under normal conditions, what we call the percent saturation, how much of the hemoglobin is actually bonded to um, oxygen? is around 68 to 70%, let's say close to 70% saturation. So that means that I, under normal conditions, at a pressure of oxygen that's 40 um, millimeters of mercury, your hemoglobin is about 70% saturated. What happens if you have low hydrogen ion concentration, i.e. high pH or low CO2? Well, now let's look what happens. The we're talking about now is this one. Right, and at that point, if you notice, the saturation is about 80%. So this demons, this curve demonstrates, this graph demonstrates that the, the teal curve is showing that the hemoglobin has a lesser affinity for oxygen if the curve were to shift to the left. And that's what happens when you have low protons and low CO2. The, amount of hemoglobin that can be bound by the protein is much higher, which is what we want to happen at the level of the lungs. The converse of that would be the other curve that's shown towards the right. We call that a right shift. And this is the one that, this is the curve that results when you have higher levels of CO2 and higher levels of hydrogen ion concentration. So again, low pH, and you have high CO2, right? So this is what happens in the tissues. In the tissues, what you want to happen 
is you want the hemoglobin to let go of the oxygen. You do not want it to be more saturated. You want it to be less saturated. So what happens at the tissues? At the level of the tissues, again, where the pressure is 40, pressure of oxygen, notice, we back to the, to the normal. We've already said the normal is, let's say, close to 70%, right? Rounding a little bit there. If you look at the other curve, which is over here, the saturation is only about 50%, okay? So at the level of the tissues where your increased, where your hydrogen ion concentration is increased and your CO2 is also increased, the Bohr effect and the carbamino hemoglobin effects are ensuring that the oxygen saturation is lower than, than it would otherwise would be by lowering the, the, the amount of oxygen on that hemoglobin down by about 20%. Okay, in the lungs, what you want is the exact opposite. In the lungs, that low hydrogen ion concentration and that low CO2, again, these are the carbamino hemoglobin and four effects. They're now ensuring that that hemoglobin is saturated at about 80%, okay? So there's about a 10 to 15% gain of oxygen saturation in the tissues compared to normal. There's about a 20% loss of oxygen saturation in the tissues compared to normal, which is what we want to happen. So this, this, these graphical representations illustrate these concepts that we've been talking about. So left shift, left shift means higher affinity for oxygen, good in the lungs. Right shift means lower affinity for oxygen, optimal in the tissues. All right, there's one more effect that we need to talk about which is what's called the Haldane effect. It's actually superimposed. All of these effects sort of coexist together. And this one, in fact, has to do with how oxygen, oxygen affects the CO2 exchange between red blood cells and the circulation. Turns out that this Haldane effect, which is what we call it, the Haldane effect, is actually quite significant because it turns out that about 50% of the CO2 that's exchanged between red blood cells and blood for ultimate uh, exhalation in the lungs is coming from the effects of this, of this phenomenon. And it has to do with the ability of oxygen to increase the amount of PCO2 in the blood. So this is sort of, a, a, the, 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 the carbamino hemoglobin is sort of combined a little bit in this, but it's sort of a backwards Bohr effect as we're gonna see in a moment, as we're as it's already on this slide. So again, let's analyze it from the context of the ability of oxygen to release CO2. In the lungs, in the lungs, this is so my, my particularly operating in the lungs, where you have a lot of oxygen, that oxygen is again going to, by brute force, Exchange with protons. Remember, this is what we this is what we call. We did mention this earlier. When hemoglobin is bound to protons, is called a reduced hemoglobin. So this reduced hemoglobin interacts with boatloads of oxygen coming in from the lungs, and it exchanges for protons. And here's where you have your normal oxyhemoglobin. Well, this is an equilibrium like any other. These protons are released. And as this concentration increases, this actually feeds into the Bohr effect equilibrium. The increase in these protons causes combination with bicarbonate shifts the CO2 plus water forming bicarbonate equilibrium that ultimately forms protons and bicarbonate shifts that equilibrium to the left. Well, if it, if it goes to the left, CO2 is ultimately formed and this can be exhaled by the lungs, okay? So the increase in the PO2 that is observed in the lungs as a consequence leads to an increase in the amount of CO2 in the blood at the level of the lungs, which is where this is more optimal. And it can be up to 50%. It's an enormous effect and that then can be exhaled by the lungs, okay? So this is the effect of oxygen on hemoglobin releasing or increasing the amount of CO2 in the blood by virtue of the release of protons from 
reduced hemoglobin that then ultimately caused this equilibrium to shift to the left to increase the amount of CO2 that then goes out into the, into the, into the exhalation process. In the tissues, in the tissues where the PO2 is low, it's the Bohr effect equilibrium that is actually uh, operating. So again, there's a lots of CO2. This is the Bohr effect over here. So Haldane and Bohr are operating at opposite ends of the body. The Haldane effect was operating in the lungs. The Bohr effect is operating in the tissues. In the tissues, as we've said, this is the Bohr effect again, right? The CO2 causes a, uh, the increase in CO2 causes a shift in this equilibrium to the right. That increases the number of protons. And that then comes back and feeds onto this equilibrium. The oxyhemoglobin is then going to be released, is going to be protonated, and it causes the release of the oxygen and facilitates that release of oxygen. And this is the Bohr effect. So again, Bohr and Haldane are operating in extreme positions. The carb amino hemoglobin is sort of operating along the way, it depends on how much CO2 uh, versus oxygen there is as well, as well. So again, all of these effects are sort of superimposed on each other. So this slide is sort of uh, helping summarize these, these concepts and how these effects are um, coexisting with each other and all of them contributing to how physiology works. So again, let's focus on the tissues over here. In the tissues where there's lots of CO2 being produced, that CO2 combines with water producing bicarbonate and protons. Those protons will then cause the oxyhemoglobin that has arrived to exchange with each other, the hemoglobin releases oxygen that feeds into the tissues, and that hemoglobin picks up those protons and forms the reduced hemoglobin. This red blood cell now travels to the lungs. What happens in the lungs? In the lungs, we have boatloads of oxygen coming in. The oxygen then exchanges with hemoglobin for the protons, and it forms oxyhemoglobin. Those protons combine with bicarbonate, the bicarbonate and the um, protons combine to form water and CO2. That CO2 is then exhaled. And this is the Haldane effect. So notice how the Bohr effect operates in the tissues, the Haldane effect operates in the lungs. And again, not shown here, sort of superimposed, is the carbaminohemoglobin effect, which technically also affects this whole situation in the middle here as well. Okay, the next slide is a little bit um, more cartoonish, uh, sort of putting it in the context of. Um, a red blood cell, and this one is actually displaying the carbaminohemoglobin effect superimposed. So again, let's start in the tissues on the bottom. Cells produce boatloads of CO2. That CO2 ultimately makes it into the cells. It combines with water to form carbonic acid. Let me change colors here because the red isn't really showing up. So CO2 produced moves into the cells, combines with CO2 and water. There's an enzyme actually that facilitates conversion to uh, carbonic acid. That then breaks down into bicarbonate and protons. The protons, this and this is the Bohr effect over here, right? This is the Bohr effect. So those protons then do the exchange with the oxyhemoglobin. It becomes reduced hemoglobin. Oxygen is released. The oxygen ends up in the tissues. This is the Bohr effect. Notice here, part of the CO2 actually interacts with oxyhemoglobin, and then it produces the carbaminohemoglobin, also releasing oxygen that ultimately goes into the tissues. Okay? If you look at the one on the top, this is in the lungs, in alveolus. So what happens in the lungs? In the lungs, we have boatloads of oxygen. The oxygen enters the tissues. The tissues the, the cells, are, the oxygen is now going to exchange with the reduced hemoglobin, producing oxyhemoglobin plus the protons. The protons combine with bicarbonate. It makes carbonic acid, which then decomposes to water and CO2. The CO2 is released, and it's exhaled. Okay? Because of the large amounts of oxygen that are coming in to the cells from the lungs, any carbaminohemoglobin is going to, by brute force, uh, 
be forced to release that CO2. That CO2 then goes into the lungs. Now, let me say something important because when you get to clinical hematology, you're going to be asked if you learned about something which is known as the chloride shift. Turns out that for this to happen, the protons to be combining with the bicarbonate, the bicarbonate has to somehow get into the cell. So bicarbonate is actually the most important and most abundant carrier of CO2 in the blood, okay? Let's focus on tissue first so that you can see where it comes from. So as the CO2 enters the cells, that happens by simple diffusion. The carbonic acid breaks down into bicarbonate and protons. We've already talked about what happens down here. Turns out this bicarbonate is released into the circulation, okay? Now, because bicarbonate has a negative charge and because charge needs to be maintained, if you lose something that's negatively charged from the inside of a cell, that needs to be replaced by another negative charge. So it turns out that as bicarbonate is being extruded, uh, um, extruded if you will, or excreted is not the right term, but it's being uh, put outside, taken outside of the cell, something needs to replace it, chloride will come in and replace the bicarbonate. And this is known as the chloride shift, that exchange of bicarbonate for chloride. If I go back to the previous slide, uh, you'll see that for every bicarbonate that exits, a chloride enters. For every bicarbonate that enters, a chloride exits. That's the chloride shift. The same thing happens in the lungs. So the bicarbonate now needs to come back into the red blood cell so that it can be reconverted into CO2. So this comes in, chloride comes out. This then allows combination with the protons, form carbonic acid, form CO2. CO2 is then ultimately exhaled. Okay, so these are physiological mechanisms that allow for maximization of oxygen uptake and oxygen delivery. They allow for maximization or optimization is the, right, is the right word, optimization of oxygen uptake and oxygen delivery. They also allow for optimization of carbon dioxide uptake and carbon dioxide exhalation or delivery. Okay, all right. So. Um, I'll start to introduce this concept on this slide. It turns out that there is a series of variants, many genetic variants of hemoglobin that exist in the general population. Some of them work just fine. Others turn out to be um, the cause of disease. So one of them that's the most notable is sickle hemoglobin, hemoglobin S's in SAM. S for sickle. And what happens in hemoglobin S is that um, there's a mutation of one amino acid for another. So it turns out that um, glutamic acid, which is polar acidic, meaning having a negative charge, is replaced in the structure of beta globin by a valine. Valine has no charge because it's nonpolar. So if you notice, when something goes from being negative <coughs> to being zero, it actually has become more positive. So sickle hemoglobin is more positive than hemoglobin A. And the way that we can identify this is ta da 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 electrophoresis, right? Because you have something that has a different charge, it will migrate differently in electrophoresis. So this disease, which is caused by a mutation of an amino acid in the globin protein, creates a small hydrophobic patch on that structure. That glutamic acid, because it's polar acidic, would have been on the outside of the protein, right? To interact with the water. Well, guess what? Now it's been replaced by something that's highly hydrophobic. So what that does is that it causes a problem as the hemoglobin is traveling through the capillaries and becoming deoxygenated, it causes that hydrophobic patch to find the other one in a, in a neighboring protein and they start to aggregate. And upon aggregation, that can cause damage to the red blood cell 
ultimately leading to anemia. So because it's 12.15, I'm going to stop there. We're going to continue on Thursday. We're going to recap this discussion. We're going to look at lots of pictures related to uh, anemia related to sickle cell, to sickle hemoglobin. We'll call it sickle cell anemia. And we'll continue with that on Thursday. Everybody have a great afternoon.